Good morning, everybody. It is Friday the 13th, 2020 of November. We're in November here. Friday the 13th. I don't know. I was thinking of playing some scary music, but I just thought that maybe this year we've had enough of that. So I wanted to go over just some economics with you so that we have a nice understanding of what's going on out there. Then we're going to move on to uh, some charts of their main ETFs that we follow and um, take some questions today. So let me get us up and rolling here. This is a report from the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. It's a big report, so we're going to fly through it. COVID, it's bad. All right, so the economy. We know that it fell off a cliff and GDP growth this year is going to be negative by quite a bit. So when you think about the economy and whether or not it's improving, there's two things to think about. A, is it improving at an increasing or decreasing rate? And B, how long before we get back to 2019 numbers? So we see that industrial production has rebounded, but the line has stopped improving as well as it did off of the bottom. So what we've seen is people claiming this is a V-shaped recovery, and it sure looks like a V-shape, but what really will happen is that this is gonna tilt over this way. So how long does it take to get back to here? Remember, I started telling you in 2018 that things were turning over. And everybody was like, come on, Kirk, it's not, everything's great. But really, it did turn over. So we were probably headed into some sort of a recession anyway, we just wouldn't have gotten the collapse. So as this turned over, by this time this year, we probably would have been in this area. Because of COVID, we're down here. So does it take a year to, to get back to the area that I thought we were going to? And then another year or two to get back up here? I think probably. So I think you shouldn't expect the economy to recover fully to 2019 levels probably until 2022 or 2023. Uh, my guess would be 2023. Why? The banking system is pretty damaged around the world. Uh, they are reserving for loan losses at very high levels. And with a quarter of the small businesses in the United States going under, uh, we don't know how many of those will come back and how fast. Now, for sure, a lot of these smaller small businesses, your mom, pop places, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 employees. Some of them, uh, and as we've learned, PPP was uh, heartily abused. A lot of them were able to squirrel money away into savings during this downturn. Some of those businesses will still go out of business because it just makes sense for them to declare bankruptcy on business A, take a vacation, and then open business B. So I think a lot of that flipping is going to go on. I'm talking to business owners in three cities right now. Uh, and, and plans to talk to owners of businesses in three other cities. I just haven't gotten around to the phone calls. And that is what we're seeing all over the place. So as your small businesses go under, and a lot of them are going to go under in January, uh, they're trying to just gut it out through the holidays. Um, they're going to close shop. Most of the baby boomer businesses will not reopen. A lot of these boomers who had a set amount in the stock market aren't going to take whatever money they have and throw it into the stock market. What they're most likely to do is just plump up their bank accounts, maybe buy some municipal bonds. So I wouldn't expect a big push from baby boomer money back into the market. We know that there's already trickle out from there. Could it flatten for a year or two? It could. Uh, but for the most part, boomers are entering their net withdrawal years. So that's important for us to think about when it comes to how are we going to invest. Global Purchasing Managers Index uh, has recovered, uh, not to the highs from a couple of years ago, but almost to where we were in 2019. The problem is that it's starting to turn over again. So there's a pretty good chance that come Q1, we're going to get a, a double dip, you know, get something that looks like this and come back out of it in Q2 and Q3. Again, what does that mean to stocks? Unemployment fell off a, a cliff and employment fell off a cliff all over the world. Um, UK had already had big problems. So 
we will see what happens um, going forward with Brexit. I don't expect a big European shock, but somebody pointed something out to me um, about innovation in Europe, and it really just isn't there. So while they are going to go after American tech companies and Chinese tech companies for antitrust, the problem is that they really don't have a culture of uh, entrepreneurial innovation. And that's their bigger problem. So between the Europeans finding ways to screw things up from time to time, the fact that they don't look at um, business growth the same way Americans and Chinese and Japanese do, and Koreans, you know, really the Europeans are, are just so far behind when it comes to being entrepreneurs that we should be very concerned with that being the second largest economic bloc uh, behind the United States, uh, Canada and Mexico, what is going to happen if they start to turn over again economically, which I expect will probably happen even with the stimulus that they're doing, because it is very centrally controlled. And while I think in the United States, big business is more of a risk than big government, in Europe, it is clearly the opposite. Big government is more of a risk than big business. And in the United States, it goes back and forth, depending on who's in office. In Europe, it's pretty consistently big government is, is a problem. Same thing in India. So unemployment spike started to come down, but not anywhere near where it needs to be, to be full employment. This is something I've talked about for years, the amount of trade. Trade fell off a cliff and now it's starting to rebound. Uh, the problem is that under President Trump, it stopped rising and started you know, leveled and looked like it was turning over even before coronavirus, the result of the trade wars. Under Joe Biden, you should probably see a rebound in global trade. Uh, because he is going to at least play nice with our allies. Uh, although I think he will take a hard line with China as well, uh, as he has in the past. Volume of trade, you know, we need to get this rising again on that slope, or at least close to it. Even if it flattens out a little bit, having it be completely flat like it was the last few years was already part of why I told you in 2018 that we were heading for a recession in 2020. And I forecast that two years ahead of time. Again, coronavirus made it worse, amplified it. Uh, however, it was already coming. Baltic dry index is never going to be quite the same, right? So, I mean, this was just the hot money era. Um, what's normal? It's hard, hard to know. Global trade is going to play a huge role in that. There was an overbuilding of ships for a while. Uh, so really, this is a trade indicator for if you're going to trade stocks. Uh, right now, I would anticipate that this is turning over again. I mean, look, look how it's already heading down. So we should be very cautious. Inflation, there's no inflation anywhere uh, as, as far as consumers think of it, uh, or as far as the government tells consumers to think of it. But again, when you go to the grocery store, you can tell what you're getting a break on is your energy bills. Uh, so that is you know, a major component of the economy. Energy has, has, inflation has been super low for a long time, uh, but precious metals have shot up. So this correction in precious metals, uh, I think is probably a buying opportunity. And we'll take a look at that in a few minutes. Industrial metals, if they come through with stimulus, especially infrastructure bills, uh, this will go up. Uh, having some remodeling done, just minor stuff. And I will tell you, and helping my daughter uh, build an extra room in her salon, uh, which she's done a great job building uh, lumber. It's not as high as it was over the summer, but it's still pretty expensive. And the indicators on uh, lumber versus the economy are, are flashing, flashing yellow right now. Uh, we've talked about the cross indexing of metals and, and lumber and other factors of the economy. And right now uh, we're shaping up to have a pretty rough first quarter. Again, inflation, you know, headline CPI, right? What the government reports to you. If you add up your bills year over year, if you had a spreadsheet where you kept track of all your bills, you would see that inflation is more in the range of four, five, six, seven percent than zero, one, two percent. It's a measure that is flawed 
because of what they put in the basket. Emerging economies, uh, typically higher inflation has to do with currencies. Um, I would expect that the emerging market currencies are going to get universally stronger in coming years, uh, particularly the younger and resource rich economies, which we've talked about repeatedly. Uh, we should keep an eye on Indonesia. We should keep an eye on Brazil. We should keep an eye on Malaysia. There are certain economies out there that are poised to do very, very well, especially because they're young and have resources. And as the uh, OECD company countries, you know, your China, your United States, or Europe, as we start spending money on infrastructure again and just printing money to do it, a lot of that money will flow to the resource countries. Uh, lucky for the United States, we are a resource country. China, not so much. Japan, not so much. Uh, so that will benefit some, be detrimental to others. We've talked about a couple of uh, industrial mining companies that we like a lot and an ETF. Money market spreads are coming back down, so that's good. Bond yields are at historic lows again. Realistically, that's bad uh, because at some point, the bond vigilantes ask for more money. Right? People who give us the money for the bonds, unless we're just going to monetize debt, you know, there's, there's going to be higher interest rates one way or the other. Either we buy the bonds back through the central banks, treasuries issue the debt, their own central bank buys it, that devalues currencies, creates inflation. It's one reason why I've turned warm from cold, not hot, but I've turned warm to Bitcoin and why I'm very warm on gold, especially gold miners. Uh, who just have all kinds of money drop into their bottom line right now. Because it doesn't matter, really, if, if gold price goes up or down $100 from where it is, it's still really high compared to where it was. So the miners do, do well. They might do a little less well under one circumstance, but if gold spikes, all of a sudden, you know, it's a windfall. Stock market indexes around the world have done the V-shaped recovery from the panic and have started to level off almost everywhere. Um, we're seeing in China right now, uh, some technology stocks getting crushed. So that is something that we wanna be aware of. Uh, those are good long-term buys and we're going to buy some of them soon. This is the one that you always wanna watch is China, right? They manipulate it, then they let it run. They manipulate it, then they let it run. So there's almost a predictable way to play China. Uh, through ETFs. I have a hard time buying the individual stocks, even Alibaba. Alibaba is the only one that I would buy, uh, mainly because it's incorporated in the Caymans and it's cloud. And I don't think that the Chinese can extricate themselves from it very much. So even though they've slapped Alibaba down, um, if it gets into our buy zone and it's closing in, Alibaba is the one stock that I buy out there because the size of the cloud in Southeast Asia, where Alibaba is the cloud leader, is going to end up being about five times bigger than it is in the United States. And Alibaba's, I mean, realistically, could be worth double or triple, or maybe even quadruple what Amazon is at some point. I mean, we're talking a three, four, five trillion dollar company potentially. I don't like really any of the other Chinese stocks, they all have flaws really the cloud that I want to focus on. Public finances, you know, how do we really want to think about public debt and GDP anymore? Uh, it's all so manipulated on the GDP side and the debt is so overwhelming that we know that it can't be repaid, can't be repaid, uh, not in 10 lifetimes. So how do we look at debt? Well, you go all the way back to Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney said during the Reagan administration, debt doesn't matter. And for 40 years, we've been running up debt, right? We, we ran close to balanced budgets uh, once we got out of World War II all the way to the 70s. And what did it get us? We got okay growth. You know, rebuilding the world after World War II uh, provided that huge catalyst. And I'm starting to have a rethink on debt, not from the, oh, debt doesn't matter standpoint, but how much does it matter? And does it really just tell us what we should expect. 
So if governments are just going to keep running debt and eventually there will be helicopter money, um, we have to go along with the debt wave until it looks like there's going to be a crisis and until the dollar plunges, we've talked about this, if the dollar plunges, that's when we have to worry about the crisis. So a crash of the dollar is what signals a financial crisis. So if the dollar breaks through those zones that we've talked about, um, then we worry about a financial crisis. Until then, we might have to find ways to make money and continue to buy the dips. Now, the dips have been few and far between uh, this year since the big crash because the Federal Reserve just keeps printing money. Again, that's not the right term, uh, but they keep expanding their balance sheet. Once the Fed stops expanding their balance sheet, which would be a temporary occurrence, um, then that's when you get your stock market correction and you wait for the signal that the Fed is going to resume uh, expanding their balance sheet. So let's think about Chairman Powell's tenure so far. He's been in there three years and he basically immediately started raising interest rates and reducing the size of the Fed balance sheet. And we got some doozy corrections in 2018. President Trump got angry. And really since September of 2019, the Fed has been expanding the balance sheet and we had this huge rally crash and now another huge rally. When would I expect the Fed to pause on expanding the balance sheet? Anytime now. I mean, I don't know if Powell has political motivations or exactly how he's looking at things, uh, but clearly the stock market is at bubble levels. We know that it is just looking at valuations and even adjusting for the zero and, and, and near zero interest rates, even adjusting for all of that. We're at at least a second standard deviation for valuations and a norm, at normalized interest rates, uh, we're at third standard deviations. And that never, never fails to have a correction. It's just a matter of how low will it go. And with us being at third standard deviation, right, three zones outside of where it normally would be, how far back will it come? Well, my guess is that it doesn't go back to the old mean because interest rates are low. What it'll do is go somewhere between the old mean and where it is now. Maybe a 50% retrace, get back to between that one and two standard deviation range, and then you probably have to buy. And we'll take a look at that in a chart as well. So when it comes to gross debt, you know, the numbers are just so enormous. How do you wrap your head around it? I think the only thing that you can say is, we can never ever repay our debts. And eventually there will be a financial crisis. And, we, and at that point, there will be helicopter money. Helicopter money being they legitimately just print it because they're going to have to bail out the boomer retirement system. You have 75% give or take of boomers who have who are already broke. And of the 25% that aren't essentially broke, right? Um, you know, probably half of them will be in the next decade. And that's that's not good when you only have 10 to 15% of the boomers who are legitimately able to retire. So again, what difference does that make? I don't think we know. So when people talk about debt, like they've been doing for, you know, four decades, you really do have to ask yourself the question, to what extent does the debt matter? And to whom does it matter? It is clearly much worse for everybody else in the world than it is for the United States. Why? because we have the millennial generation, which offsets the boomers. So our age curves are flattening out for now. Now, if the millennials don't have two children per household, right? If they don't average a child per person, uh, which it doesn't look like they will, um, you know, then there's a problem 20, 30, 40 years down the road there too. Birth rates, demographics, they really matter. Death rates matter. We talked about COVID. Uh, last week, just for a minute. And I want to expand on that because I've been thinking about it a lot. With COVID, you're going to see a couple million people around the world die. And in the United States, the estimates are looking like it'll be around a half a million by spring. So we're at a quarter million now and that number will probably double in the next six months. Most of those folks are older folks, which means that their social security checks stop 
which means that their pension checks are, most of them. That is actually a net positive for the retirement system because you get rid of those drawdowns. So will it have a major impact? No, it'll be minor, uh, but it is something at the margins that we should be aware of, uh, especially with the pension system. You know, it is something that could help the pension system way more than it helps Social Security, because Social Security, despite what the people who pound the table on Social Security being broke say, Social Security is not anywhere close to broke. There's enough money in the Social Security Trust Fund, presuming, you know, those debts are honored, uh, to pay Social Security at 70 to 80 percent, even for my generation and the millennials. So we have a very small gap to make up on Social Security. I'm not too worried about that. That is minor tax law changing, you know, raising the full retirement age, you know, up maybe another year over a generation. That's all it takes to fix Social Security. The state and local pensions are a problem, though, because they're underfunded by 10, 20, 30 percent in many cases. I've seen pensions go under. I've seen union pensions go under. It's usually a combination of bad management and companies taking over the pensions so that they can float that money into other places and they borrow it from one pocket to put it in another pocket and then it never gets returned. And that spurred on a lot of tax law changes and pension changes uh, that should fix things with, uh, you know, there's going to have to be a jolt of money, you know, five, six, seven trillion dollars at some point uh, to bail out all those systems. We will see um, how that goes. But again, a falling dollar, a crashing stock market, all those things lead to a financial crisis. So when you have all these problems just sitting there, it'll be a domino effect when it goes. And again, I don't know when that'll be. I've said by the end of the decade, I've, I've speculated towards the end of the decade uh, for a financial crisis. But if we destroy the dollar, that is your signal that it's coming sooner. And that's why we look at monetary policy. Interest rates are nothing. How long can that be maintained before either the lenders demand more money or inflation goes up, right? I don't think we're that far away. And what we have learned is that the monetary policy has not spurred growth anywhere in the world, no, nowhere. Our fiscal policies are so bad globally our bureaucracy is so overbearing in parts of the world, not so much in the United States. You know, it goes from good to less good and then less good to good. You know, right now I would say that we're a little bit less good um, because certain regulatory things are, are, are quite damaging. So there's gotta be a balance with regulation. Uh, and some of the things that President Trump did were good, uh, but some of the things he did were just crazy. So. There has to be a balancing out. You know, I believe um, that because a lot of it was done with executive orders, and I trust Joe Biden more than I trust President Trump, um, I believe that incoming President Biden uh, will fix a lot of the things that were wrong, and I think he'll quietly keep a lot of the things that worked out. Um, I, I do think that one of the perspectives that Biden has is having worked for both um, you know, working for Obama uh, and, and being in the Senate so long uh, and then coming in and seeing what President Trump did and being able to evaluate what worked and what didn't work uh, and what was dangerous and what's not dangerous. Uh, I, I think we actually probably have a lot of positives coming uh, because the broken things will be fixed and the things that worked will be kept. Uh, that's what I expect to happen. Uh, the problem for the economy in the next year or two though, is the recovery from COVID. So even with a vaccine sometime in 2021, which I'm sure there will be, uh, I'd be surprised if there's not, I'd be horrified if there's not. Uh, I think that we will see the economy start to recover in the, in the summer. But the process of recovery is very, very slow. Why? Because the monetary policy hasn't really helped. It'll take fiscal action. And the problem we have is that right at the moment, it looks like Mitch McConnell is going to be Senate Majority Leader. And he is all for tax breaks and monetary policy, but he doesn't want to see the budget actually 
you know, spend money on, on clean energy or infrastructure or telecommunications or space projects. You know, his mindset is just pump the money into the privacy system and see, see what happens. And there's validity to that at a certain level. But again, it's imbalanced. People complain about the recovery under President uh, Obama, right? It jumped really fast and then it leveled off. What was the difference between the first two years of President Obama's terms and the last six? It's that Mitch McConnell openly said that his goal was to block everything that Obama wanted to do, cause the slow recovery. You got years and years of pent up demand, and then they did the tax cuts to unleash that pent up demand. Well, the problem is that the debt ran up further, which again, we may or may, may, or may not make a difference at this point because gigantic is gigantic, right? And we have done a decent job of protecting the dollar within that Goldilocks range that I've talked about, but we're threatening to break through. We're getting into the danger zone. And, you know, we're approaching the danger zone. So that's what we have to keep an eye on. So um, trade, trade balances, uh, what we know is that Tariff war did not help us in terms of trade. Hasn't, right? You see any great big, huge advantages, right? We're in the same spot. And then the nominal trade balance actually fell. So we haven't done all that well, right? But there was already a trend in place. Trade wars didn't help it. Current account balance, right? Is there even a trend here? You know, between the tariff wars and coronavirus, I don't think we know. So there's a lot of things that we have to keep an eye on, but I think the biggest one is we have to watch the dollar. So let's do that. This is probably the most important chart out there. And I want you to see this going all the way back. So this yellow area, uh, it's on a smaller screen, so it looks a little different. This red area, this red box, so we saw the dollar get crushed. We got a financial crisis out of it. Obama and Biden stabilized the dollar, and then it rose. And then President Trump said it was too strong, and he tried to beat it up, and he did. And we got the um, asset inflation that he wanted. The problem was is it pushed us closer and closer to a financial crisis. The Federal Reserve, Powell started to push back, push the dollar back up. President Trump started whining about that again. So as you can see, September 2019, Chairman Powell started to push the dollar back down. He had your spike into the start of the year and then with coronavirus, it was already rising before coronavirus. Why? Because we knew that we were probably headed into a recession back in January. There are all sorts of forecasts out there that we were heading into a recession back in January. And then coronavirus hit and turned it into a depression. Dollars plunged as recovery took hold and as the Federal Reserve printed mountains of money. Joe Biden, as I told you way back in July and August, the dollar would stabilize if the market started to believe that Biden would be president. And that is what we got. So now the next question is, can we keep the dollar in this Goldilocks zone? In here, we get organic growth. We don't suffer from inflation. The rest of the world is stable. This is really where the dollar needs to be. This area here, I would say, is where you're starting to worry. The problem is asset prices go up, in many cases, as the dollar gets into the danger zone, just like it did here. Everybody was rooting and tooting, 2004, 5, 6, 7, right? And then it broke through. We got the financial crisis. So do you really want a weak dollar? Not if you want to avoid a financial crisis. So right now we're okay. I suspect we're going to test this line again soon in the next several months. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, honestly, the Georgia senatorial elections are a big deal. We probably don't get any positive fiscal stimulus. Uh, if the if the Republicans hold either one of those seats, to be honest with you. I mean, you can see what Mitch McConnell is doing right now. Doesn't want to do anything more than several hundred billion dollars for stimulus, a very minimalistic approach. Uh, he just wants to keep forcing it in through the monetary system because it forces certain asset prices up. Eventually, the economy will get so weak though, 
with the approach that he's using, which what I don't know if Mitch McConnell's bought and paid for, if he's just economically ignorant. Um, I suspect the first one. What happens if the economy turns over into uh, a deeper depression? What if the recovery takes three or four years? I think that that is something that would um, cause a major, major conflict in this country, even worse than what we saw the last year. Because you would see a rise of socialism on one side and a rise of look what Biden did and Democrats did on the other side. When really, we're set up for everything right now. So keep this in mind. If this economy double dips and it lasts several years and it takes a long time to get out of COVID, it's a shadow. We're already there. And if Mitch McConnell blocks fiscal policy that can help rebuild the country from infrastructure and to expanding clean energy, because the fossil fuels just aren't coming back. You can want them to, you can think they are, but you'll be wrong. The question is, is do we want to fall behind China and the rest of the world in development? If you truly are a patriot, then you want the United States to lead on all these technological and clean energy things. So there's all sorts of resources out there for you. I encourage you to go to the World Bank websites. Okay, their data bank is amazing. I mean, you just, I mean, you, can, you view everything in charts. Uh, well, you gotta sign up, but you know, there's all sorts of things out there that you can get. Deloitte, they have a weekly economic update. This is one of the best ones out there. If you do nothing else, just read the, you know, you can skip reading the paper almost, right? This is free. Weekly global economic update from Deloitte, right? The insurance companies have them, you know, PIMCO, Allianz, Manulife. There's plenty of materials out there. Stay away from the overt opinion making, but read what's really going on around the world. Financial Times, they also have it. I don't subscribe anymore. I just let my, my subscription lapse, um, but you can still see the headlines. Climate diplomacy, winning the fight against zero-sum mindset. You're going to see a major, major expansion in clean energy this decade. Solar is going to scream, scream. It's going to scream. So that's why we want to be in those alternative energy stacks. Efficiency, solar, batteries, all that stuff is going to scream. EVs, we already know what my favorite EV play is. So keep an eye on all of these things. And if you see the dollar plunge, you need to sell the spike in assets because it'll end quickly. So what do you keep an eye on? The dollar, this is, you should have this one bookmarked over at Trading View or somewhere. This is the one that you need to watch. It crosses below this line here, major warnings should go off. And if nothing else, what you'd expect is as we got into this area, the Fed is going to have to put the brakes on money supply, right? Got to bring it back up, in which case assets get crushed. Now, I've expected a smaller version of that, but if they do let the dollar come down here, right, if the Fed keeps expanding the balance sheet, at some point they have to reverse course. China's currency is strengthening right now, and that is something that we should be concerned about. Take a look at SPY. It's bumping up against this, this, this line. It's about as high as it gets. So down just above 300, on SPY is probably your, our first buy level, right? There's a 618 level. I think uh, some of the Elliott Wave guys are saying 301. So we'll want to buy a little bit before they do, although it doesn't much matter. You have to measure the momentum at the time, right? So let's take a look at this, right? Came back up. It's going to go back down. And come back up. And go back down. It's just a matter of time for me. Here's our buy zone on SPY. And remember, we don't really buy SPY. It's just a signal for us. QQQ is what we like. So QQQ is way up here, about to hit a major, major resistance level again. Could pop through this line uh, on an extension, um, but probably you're going to see it start going down here. 237, probably the first place, 238, right? First place that we really want to buy. I like this level here, about 220, 217, 218, right? A couple of uh, confluence of lines here that are all kind of big deals. These 618 lines, 236 line. Uh, if things get real bad, right? If coronavirus makes the first quarter horrible, um, which I think is very possible, right? Because we're not going to get any new policy until February. 
Trump's not going to change anything through the end of his term. So you could see it come way down here. And what did President Trump predict? He said in the debate, if Joe Biden becomes president, the stock market will crash. Do you think for a moment that he said that just willy-nilly? Do you think he was really trying to imply at a time when he knew he was probably going to lose? He's fighting it. I don't know why. I mean, all the judges are laughing at him. Um, and, and Republicans are turning on him. Do you think that he doesn't have a plan B? He knows that it's set up to come down. He knows that it's set up to come down. And he was just going to blame somebody else when it came down. China, whatever. And you should be afraid of what's going on right now at the end of Trump's term. Firing his top defense and military and national security advisors. Declaring a national emergency against China today. If that doesn't scare you, I don't, I don't know, then, man, I don't know what scares you. I mean, when I have to put faith in the Chinese to be the cooler heads, that's very, very, very scary. And if you own QQQ right now, I mean, I'd, I'd be dialing it back. I'd sell a third or a half or two thirds, depending on your asset allocation. So I want to take a look at QQQJ and QQQM. And I was going to look at X, but you know these are the two new QQQ um, funds that just came out. It doesn't really tell us anything so far. But when you compare them, take a look at the holdings. They're not even populated yet. So this is the last time we'll see ETF database, by the way. I'm switching back to Morningstar because, uh, frankly, this got hard to keep organized. And they had this stupid thing that when you get to a page, it does that makes it hard to look at, and the same ad in three spots. It's just not a well-kept website right now, and I don't know why. Um, in any case, uh, these are still relatively large cap stocks. So what we're going to do here over the next few weeks is go through these two new ETFs, take a look at how much volume they're getting, because um, we want to know, you know how good are these going to be. You know, one of our central thesis has been buy mid-cap stocks that have good growth, right? In the middle of their S-curve, good trajectory and going to get added to the S&P 500 at some point. That'll still be a good a way to invest. So I think that these might be, if you want a passive approach versus the active that we have with ARC, you can use this. You could, you could go half and half, third, two thirds, whatever you want to do. So if you want to hedge your bet that Kathy Wood is perfect, um, you know, then you do some indexing. So this is something that you know, I'll have to write an article about so that people can decide how to use them for themselves. One of the exchange traded funds that we added to our universe a while back, because it's really the best way to play the emerging markets if you're not in resources, is their internet technology and their e-commerce. So this is down, uh, looks like pretty substantially again today, given back all of yesterday's gains. This can come back to about 46, 47, 48, right in here. I think we gotta buy it. Uh, the largest holding is Alibaba. And that's your, if you don't wanna own an individual stock in uh, Alibaba, you buy this. I'll probably buy both, but just smaller positions. So rather than having this fund where Alibaba is 10%, I'll buy this fund and then I will buy enough Alibaba so that you know it's more like 25% of my total weighting into the emerging markets e-commerce space. And so I'll do a quick thoughts on that as well for you. But this is a very good fund. And when you compare it to other emerging market funds, it blows it away. This, this is the sweet spot to be in emerging markets unless you're gonna do country investing, like we talked about with Indonesia, um, to get the resource play. So between this and some country investing, I think that this is the play on international and emerging markets. And then we have the dividend paying, the global dividend stock um, ETF that we're using that is, you know, beats the S&P 500. So let's go to gold. So I'm actually going to show you actual gold. We're at the top of the buy zone on GLD. So if you don't have a GLD position and you want one, I would say probably sell puts with a strike price of like, you know, 170, 
175, right in that range. Collect all that premium out to January so that your net cost would be somewhere in here. At 160, you mean you really want to just buy it outright. So if you can do a put sale, sell a put, and your ending net cost would be around 160, low 160s, I think you've done a pretty good job. There's a couple of reasons why gold is going to just keep on doing well. One, all the, all the big governments in the world are print, printing money. Again, not the right term, but it's easiest to say. They're doing inflationary policy. Gold really hasn't had any new discoveries in a long time. And I think we're getting close to the point where the junior miners even do, do well. I actually found a junior miner in Canada that I really like. Um, Newmont Mining is probably going to buy me. So we have to take a look at some of those things. It's, it's, on, it's on the pink sheets. I can't trade it uh, in my accounts. I'm not allowed to, um, but I will throw it out there for all of you. So gold, anywhere in this range, the gold companies just are making a ton of money, right? The likelihood of gold dropping below here is really, really low. So even at jitterbugs for a while, that means that the gold stocks are still doing extremely well. And what do we have? Suddenly, this is in the buy zone, just at the edge, but I'd be buying this 36, 37, all the way down to 32, 33. It ain't gonna get much lower than this. These companies have money pouring in. You are seeing companies like Newmont and Barrick, which are the biggest holdings here uh, in this uh, ETF, raise their dividends 15, 20, 30, 40%. I mean, there's, I, I forget what Barrick just did. It was huge. Now, if you don't want to buy the ETF, I do think that you can scale into Newmont and Barrick. Newmont, you have to buy when the S&P 500 goes down because Newmont is in the S&P 500. Barrick, you just buy every time it dips because you know that there's a floor under it. Why? Because Warren Buffett's company is buying it. So that's how you buy into Barrick and you buy into Newmont. You buy Newmont when the S&P 500 goes down, you buy Barrick anytime it dips. And we can take a look at those two charts. I don't mind sharing those. Normally we don't want to uh, share our stocks, but everybody knows that we're in these. So Barrick, as it approaches middle 50s, if it gets down there, is it positive? Oh, it's negative today, right? And gold, let's see if I can do this right the first time. Barrick's already in our buy zone. So I, if you don't own Barrick Gold, I think you can go and buy Barrick Gold right now. And then let's talk about the oil shorts. The CTF is loaded up with shale drillers. IEA and OPEC both just lowered their oil demand charts. So for whatever reason, people think that this is going to do well. Up a buck 55 today. Um, it's a weekly chart, that's why, a daily chart. On these pops up in this range, you see that it's at a couple of different areas here where if it doesn't hold, it doesn't break through this zone, this confluence here, which I don't think it will, then you're going to see it fill this gap. This gap here is going to get filled again. So this will come all the way back down to about 40-ish. But really, the big break is as it keeps coming down here as some more of these companies go bankrupt and as some of the other ones merge. And as people realize that oil and gas just aren't gonna get that much more expensive for quite a while, right? Gas isn't gonna get more expensive unless there's a global move to get rid of coal. And coal is still, use is still going up inexplicably to me, even though it's going down in America, America and Europe. Asia's using more and more of it, India, China. So natural gas isn't going to get that more expensive unless there's really a major move to attack coal, I mean, globally. And we can do what we want to do, but, uh, you know, the utilities are already taking care of it in America. This should break through to this area imminently. And then once it breaks through this area, so I think it'll jitterbug a while, it's going to go all the way down here to 30-ish. Why is that? Because when you look at the underlying holdings, you realize that a solid one third of the companies in XOP are probably bankrupt right now. And they're probably going to be mergers of some of the other ones. My guess is that XOP doesn't exist as a fund at some point. I believe that what they'll end up doing is just adding some more stocks to XLE 
and getting rid of XOP. That'd be my guess. Of course, though, the oil CEOs believe a demand recovery is coming, even though OPEC says not. Hmm. Who do you think is right? Have these oil CEOs been telling you the truth the last decade? Do you think they'd start now? All right. So where is the stock market right now? Is it fading? It was off 300 to start today. Back there again. So let's finish with this. Or actually, we'll do a couple questions. This is what I said before the market opened. I said fade the stock market into lunch because after lunch, people are going to sell off. We'll see. I think money flows are telling us that this market probably does not close strong today. If it does, you're just seeing all sorts of kids reposition their calls and hedge funds. Again, it's all tied to liquidity. When the Fed says the party's over, the party's over. It'll be, it'll be over bad. All right, what kind of questions do we have about ETFs or macro? Somebody asked about the oil. What's driving the little pop in the last week? I think it's excess liquidity. And there was some hopium about oil prices going up. You know, we're still at the biggest inventory the world has ever seen in oil. And... In reading the comments and some of the oil articles on Seeking Alpha and another website, I mean, you got a lot of people who just believe that oil is a value and that this is a cyclical thing with oil. Oil is in secular decline, secular long-term decline, period. Demand increases were under 1% the last four, five, six years. And now we're looking at between three and 6%, hard to know exactly, between three and 6% of oil demand is permanently gone because of work from home. Three to 6%. I think it's gonna be closer to 6%. So that's 6 million barrels a day that are never coming back to the market. But even if it's 3 million barrels a day, these are companies that needed there to be growth to survive because they needed oil prices to be higher to survive. And when they say that over the life, and I'm talking about the frackers in particular, when they say that over the life of a well, they need oil to be 45 to break even. Well, with a fracking company, they're basically talking about three years, right? Because those wells, 90% of the oil is gone in three years. Do I see the price of oil being much above 45 in the next three years? I think it gets to 60 at some point. I don't think it goes much above that. And I think it might take two or three years to get there. What do those companies do with all that debt in the meantime? And there's a lot of maturities in 2022. Who's going to refinance it then? When it becomes even more apparent, the EVs are taking off. There's just two revisions to the EV forecast from 10% of sales in 2025 to 15%. That's a huge dent of oil demand there. So while I think that we probably double, double top on oil demand, from 2019 levels, probably get there again in 2024-ish, right? These people just, the people betting on oil and oil stocks think that this is cyclical. They're wrong. They're ignorant, actually, and wrong and ideological, whatever. They're just wrong. Can you trade oil? For sure. And I actually think at some point I might buy oil futures or USO. I don't think it's soon. You know, probably not next year, maybe a year from now, maybe a year and a half from now. And that's only if the economy comes back in a very healthy way. So municipal bonds, somebody asked about, there are a lot of good municipal bond funds out there. You know, PIMCO's got a couple, Nuveen's got a couple, Vanguard and Fidelity. And, and when you put them on a chart next to each other, you notice that they all do about the same thing. For muni bonds, the reason why I think that a retiree can kind of make that their second tier emergency money and throw off a little income to beat the bank, is that the Federal Reserve is never going to let the muni bond market collapse. Even if Mitch McConnell doesn't want to send money to the states, that's, the money to the states from fiscal has to do with keeping your cops and firefighters and teachers employed. The muni bond market, the Fed's all over that. So the Fed, I think, has bought 2 or 3% of all muni bonds. Um, but really what they've done is they've just backstopped the market. And they've got a lot of money there. And technically, the CARES Act expires at the end of the year. I think that's the one thing that'll get extended. Now, it might, there might be a hole, might not get extended for a while. Um, but eventually, the, the Fed really has the back of the muni bond market. So even if there is a short-term decline in muni bonds, as long as you don't panic sell, you'll be okay. 
So if you have six figure income as a retiree um, and you like the idea of keeping a couple hundred thousand dollars in bank type assets, I think throw a hundred, throw two hundred thousand dollars at muni bonds, stick with the intermediate duration for most of the money, but you could probably throw a quarter of your money even at high yield. So three quarters intermediate duration, one quarter high yield. And the high yields only get you a couple extra points. Um, but I do think that as the economy strengthens, you actually make a little bit of capital gain there too. And then you could sell that and flip it into intermediates maybe if you wanted to. Somebody asked me if I look through the 13 Gs. What's a 13 G? I've never heard of it. Come on, man. I talk about the holdings and ETFs and funds all the time. Yes, I look at the holdings. That's how I determine whether an ETF is worthwhile. You know, when I take a look at what the hedge funds are buying, right? So that's what Value Walk is all about. Value Walk has the uh, screeners to see what the, um, I think you might even, yeah, whatever. Um, yeah. So you take a look at what the underlying holdings are. And like small cap stocks, if you start to notice hedge funds buying certain small cap stocks, that's actually one of the best indicators out there. So um, what is it, Insider Monkey? I mean, they sell a, a, a subscription on, on following the small cap hedge funds. I, I get that. So when I find one, I, I tell you guys about it. I, mean, that's, I got like 30, 40 subscriptions still. I got rid of 20 or 30. I couldn't read everything. That's why I got rid of the Financial Times. It was the most expensive and it's not better than Bloomberg or Wall Street Journal anymore. It's just, they're all kind of the same. So do I miss an article, right? Does somebody, does somebody break something a day ahead of somebody else once in a while? Sure. But you just, you run out of time to read everything, right? And even though I have an AI combing for certain ideas, you know, again, how much time do you have to read? So that's when technical analysis becomes important. I know that people don't want to do technical analysis, but the reality is that it tells you um, what's the market's thinking and the big money in particular for the longer term time durations. Because the big institutions don't day trade, right? The hedge funds and the day traders day trade. So the very short term stuff, the hourly and the daily stuff, ah, not so important to me, never has been, right? I'm primarily a position trader. I do a little hedging for a month or two at a time, you know, or a little catalyst investing for a month or two at a time. But as a position trader, you take a look at these monthly and these, these weekly charts and the technicals become pretty apparent. And RSI and MFI and Shaken and MACD, those four, they're so easy to learn that when you put them together, it tells you a story. So between that, and, and certain ways of finding where the smart money is going, those are all good ways to, to clue yourself in. So this whole idea that there's gonna be a big shift of value investing is bullshit. There's not. Most of the value price stocks are cheap for a reason, right? I mean, what's the old saying? Sometimes a cheap stock is, is cheap for a reason. I think that's the case in most, in most of those. Now. On our barbell, right? When we have our barbell, what we know is that some of these are value priced. So this is where you look for value. Certain REITs, gold, Bitcoin, certain material plays, and then yield generating alternative energy. And somebody asked me what alternatives are. For, for most people, it's, it's private equity, right? And I hinted that you should kind of be your own venture capital investor your own angel investor last week. I told you, you ought to be looking in your own communities for small businesses or real estate to invest in. There are commercial real estate is gonna to need to be rehabbed and repurposed. So you have to get a very significant discount. And a lot of the prices haven't come down yet because it hasn't been on the market long enough. But at some point as places sit empty, as you watch a place sit empty for months, go in there with an offer, make it really low, low ball them. You know, not embarrassingly low, not insultingly low, but something that you can explain and say, look, this property isn't worth what it was in 2019. And it's not worth what it was in 2010 either. So the price is somewhere in between there. This is what I think it's going to take to repurpose this property and rehab it. This is what I could pay you. And if you know people who want to start a small business and you think they're going to succeed, you buy the property 
and then you work with, and then you take a, an equity stake in the small business. Maybe you give them a deal on rent on the front end is how you're buying your equity. Yeah, so you win twice. That's how bar owners do it. A lot of bar owners sell their bar to somebody, some manager who wants to be it, you know, do it after they get tired, but they own the property. And when the bar goes under, they just rent it to a new kid who wants to be a bar owner. So if you own the property and then get a piece of the business that's going in there, it's a pretty good model for you. So if you're sitting on hundreds of thousands of dollars, I want you to think about that because I'm not so sure that this is going to be the most friendly stock market, right? You're going to have to be very diligent about sticking to these ideas and get and just avoiding all this other crap. And even in the REITs, I'm telling you, a third of the REITs are in big trouble and another third of the REITs are going to be zombies. And yet their services devoted exclusively to REITs and they tell you to buy like every one of them is rated to buy. Nine out of 10 are rated to buy. Anybody who's not telling you which companies are zombies and which companies to just ignore, you know, like I do, I'm telling you, I, I didn't make this stuff up. I stole it from people who are way richer and way smarter than me. You should ignore most investment ideas because there's a lot of zombies out there and there's more now than there ever has been because of the way the Fed has handled things. So no, I don't think value is going to be a significant rotation. Innovation, technology, smart, in, smart industry, consumer-driven products, right? China is going to drive even more consumerism in the future, not less. Consumerism is not going downhill. It's on pause and it's going to come roaring back. So I keep wishing that Disney would get under 100 again, but I think everybody's thinking the same thing. Everybody wants to go to Disneyland now. I haven't been to Disneyland yet. I better go. That's my plan. I'm, I'm going next fall. And clean energy, I'll just say this to close. Clean energy is the most important market in the world. And it will probably have the biggest gains in the world over the next 10 years. In an article that I'm writing, I'm, I'm writing two articles next week to respond to some other guy's oil article. And I'm making fun of them in the title. You'll see. One, oil is a secular decline. Two, I think the title of the article is going to be A Simple Truth. Clean energy stocks will crush oil stocks in the 2020s. I don't know if it can be that long, but clean energy stocks will crush oil stocks in the 2020s. Crush. Even if oil price goes up in the middle of the decade, which I think it will. But when oil prices go up, what does that do? It makes clean energy stuff even more attractive. Oil can't win. Oil price goes up, clean energy does better. doesn't matter. Clean energy cannot lose that fight. Can't happen. All right. Everybody have a great weekend. Try to make it through Friday the 13th unscathed. And let's see how this market does at the end of the day. Do we get more irrationality or people start taking their profits? If you see profit taking at the end of the day on Friday, it means we might be at the start of reality setting up. Take it easy, everyone.